purpose of our presentation tonight is to give you an overview of the recursion and financial modelling topic, which is part of the core in Unit 3. It's all about giving you that sort of big picture overview so that it is um, preparing you ready for Unit 3. So depending on whether you did study general maths in Year 11 um, or did not, you will all be coming to this topic with a varied understanding of the topic itself. So the point of tonight is really just to give you that overview um, so that you feel more confident with some of the main concepts and, and um, terminology and keywords and the key rules that we'll be using throughout this topic. And so in a bit more detail, what we'll be looking at are recurrence relations, um, how they apply to growth and decay in a very general sense. Um, we'll be looking at the applications of depreciation, which is an application of decay. And then we'll be looking at very basic intro to loans and investments. Um, and along with that, time permitting, we will also then have a look at a bit of an intro to the finance solver on our calculator. So beginning uh, with recurrence relations. So a recurrence relation is a term that we use, uh, sorry, a, a, an equation or a style of rule that we use to allow us to explain a sequence, a pattern of numbers. In further maths, we are concentrating on two key types, which is looking at modelling growth or decay over time periods. So growth is talking about an increasing um, set of numbers and decay talking about a decreasing set of numbers. And so we look at uh, what we call a linear form, which is where we have that constant increase um, or decrease occurring. We look at a geometric form, which we think of more as like an exponential, that sort of curve increase or decrease. And then later in the applications, we start looking at a combination of both of those things. And that's where we tend to get in those loans and investment style of application. Some things to note about recurrence relations is that we cannot simply jump to a, a term, so 10 years down the line. They are a style of equation that means that we need uh, one component in order to find the next. And I guess a reminder is how we actually read this recurrence relation here. So A0 is talking about what is the initial, what's the starting point? So A0 or V0 can refer to that initial starting point of that sequence. The way we read this here, AN plus one, is a way of sort of saying the next term is given to us by, and then we're doing either a multiplication and or an addition to the current term. So we're, we're applying that rule to our current term to get the next one. If we do want to um, find uh, terms in a sequence that is much further down the line, we're better to convert to general rules and we will have a look at that this evening. So starting off with the basics of growth and decay. <clears throat> So linear growth and decay, as we said, linear is where each successive term in the sequence is bound by a constant increase or decrease. So we're adding or subtracting that same value each time. So this is the form where we don't have a value of R represented in the rule, and we are just either adding for growth or subtracting for decay that value of D, that constant change. And the most common applications that we look at in further maths are flat rate depreciation, unit cost depreciation, and also simple interest loans or investments. And we're going to have a look through those now. So in its most basic form, linear growth, as we said, it's that form where we are adding a constant value, so D. And so if we take, for example, a recurrence relation form here, where T0, our starting point is 10, and then the next term in the sequence is bound by the current term plus three. So if we were to generate the next four terms in the sequence, it would look like this. So 10 is our starting point and each successive term, we are simply adding three. We also want to be able to graph the sequences sometimes and you'll note here it is a linear increase. So we have a straight line graph, much like a time series where we're plotting over terms or periods of time, 
each of those values of the term. We're then to convert that to a general rule form. Here we are taking with our general rule these key components, our V0, our initial term, and our value of D here. And so when we put that together into that general rule, we have something of this form, so Tn instead of Tn plus one. And you'll note here, we're using our initial term, the value of D times N. <clears throat> so that means when we want to find term 12, we now can jump straight to term 12 by using that rule. And that would be our calculation that we are doing. 10 plus three times 12 gives us 46. Moving on now to linear decay. So this is the same idea, the same concept, but instead of an increasing sequence, we now have a decreasing sequence. So the main change is that we are now subtracting D in both our recurrence relation form and in the um, general rule form. All other components though stay the same. So in this case, if we've got our rule where P0 is 20, the next term is bound by the current term minus four, then our first four terms of the sequence, again, same thing, starting at 20 and subtracting four each time. Similarly, the graph, we now have a decreasing or a negative slope to that, um, that linear line. If we're to jump to our general rule, we take again our initial term, 20, and our value of D, four in this case, and put that together into our rule to create that general rule for this sequence. And again, if we were to find P12, so we want to find um, the 12th iteration or application of the rule, we can use that equation to find that value. And so here we have negative 28, but it is possible to end up very quickly with a negative value, even if we are only subtracting. <clears throat> now looking at one of our common applications, so simple interest. Simple interest is a, an application of growth. So it's an increasing form. So you think about we've got some um, money that we have invested and we are earning interest on our investment. So when we're looking at this type of application, the recurrence relation and the general rule form of that are very similar to that just that linear growth. We tend to talk about our initial value as principal. So that is the amount we've invested. We have our value of D. Sometimes we are told um, our rate of interest. OK, and so there we might have to do a next step calculation to work out what is the constant amount that is being earned each time period. And we'll look at an example in the next section. And so things to look out for. You want to look obviously for the keyword simple interest or an absence of compound interest. Sometimes it is just called flat rate. And so you're looking for those things. Be careful just because there is a percentage not to confuse this with compound interest. At the moment, it will seem very straightforward, but at the end of the topic, we have many common key terms and it can be easy to confuse um, those applications. So be looking for those keywords, simple interest or flat rate, and knowing and feeling confident that this is what you're working towards. So if we look at this example here, we have an amount of $800 invested for seven years at a simple interest rate of 4% per annum. And so for the first part there, what I should be doing when I read the question is highlighting those key pieces of information. So that $800 is representing my starting point. So that's V0. Um, I have an interest, a simple interest rate of 4% per annum. So my little value of R is four. And so if I want to find firstly, the amount of interest earned in, um, by the investment in the first year, I'm simply wanting to find out what is that value of D that I'm going to add in that first year. And so we find that by using the formula <clears throat> where D is R over 100 times V0. And so that gives us $32 interest. For the value of the investment after seven years, I'm going to jump straight to using a general rule here because if I was to use a recurrence relation, I can still arrive at the same answer, but I recognise that I'm going to need to um, jump to a particular point. So I'm better off, if I can, constructing a general rule. And so the value of my investment after seven years, 
firstly set up my general rule, then I can say that I know n is 7. And so that allows me by substituting in where n is 7, that I can find my value after seven years is 1024. It's good practice to do your calculations and then write your final answer. In this case, we are talking about a monetary value. So it is good practice to write that with a dollar sign at the beginning. And if it wasn't a whole number, be checking that you are giving it to the correct accuracy. With monetary values in further maths, it is always two decimal places unless you're told otherwise every single time. Part three, the amount of interest earned after seven years. So what we're asking for here is if we started with $800 and after seven years, we ended up with $1,024, how much interest did we earn in that time frame? So what we're saying is the value of the investment minus our principal, our starting point, will give us the amount of interest we earned. And so it's just a simple little subtraction there, which means we earn um, $224. <clears throat> now moving on to some geometric growth and decay. So these are the ones where we have um, multiplying by a constant value each time. So we tend to see that exponential increase or decrease. So here you'll notice in our recurrence relations to begin with, we have this value of R, no value of D. So there's nothing being added or subtracted here. It's just that standalone multiplier. If that value of R is greater than one, then we're going to see that growth. If the value of R is less than one, so between zero and one, a decimal value there, we're going to see a decay or a de decreasing sequence. And so the common applications that we look at here are reducing balance depreciation and compound interest loans and investments. These are just the simple type of ones where there's no additional payments made. And so firstly, geometric growth. So here we can see our occurrence relation form and our general rule form. And our general rule looks a little bit different, but it might feel familiar because you do have that exponential component there. And so for our example, if we have S0, our starting point of 10, and our next term is given up to us by two times the current term, our first four terms will be 10, then times that by two gives us 20, times 240 and 80 and so on. Our graph, it's a little bit difficult to see with a small number of terms, but you can see that it is starting to curve and grow quickly. So it doesn't take long for that exponential um, visual to sort of kick in in the graph. When I'm taking this to a general rule form, maybe you're taking again your V0, your initial value, and this value of R here. So in this case, to convert to a general rule, we can say that Sn is equal to two to the power of N times 10. So in this case now to find S8, we're saying if S8 is here, I've got two to the power of eight times 10. And that gives me that value of 2,560. Very similar when we're looking at geometric decay. So again, our rules look exactly the same. The difference here is that our value of R will be something between zero and one. So your recurrence relation form and your general rule form will look exactly the same as it did for growth. So our example here where we're starting A0 at 100 and our AN plus one is equal to 0 0.5 times AN, our first four terms, we can see there 100 down to 50, down to 25, 12.5. Again, our graph of that sequence, we can see is reducing quite quickly. So initially the drop will be significant and then the change between each of these successive terms will become smaller and smaller and start to approach an asymptote for those of us who understand um, that level of mathematics as well. We've heard of that before. Changing to a general rule. So again, we're picking up those key components, your initial value V0, your value of R, and substituting them into our general rule here. And by the same way that we did with growth, if we wanted to find A8, 
I can now simply substitute in that value of n as 8 and work forward to get my value there. So one application is compound interest. And so this is where our same idea, I'm making an investment of a principal amount of money um, and I'm seeing it grow over time. So it's just simply I'm putting that money in the bank and I'm, and I'm earning interest on it. Another version of that might be that I take out a loan um, or potentially a credit card and I'm not paying it back. And I've just got this amount that I owe sitting there and the bank is charging me interest. So again, it's still increasing. It's still a growth model here. Couple of key things. Our principal obviously is still V0, so that's the same as for simple interest. When we're calculating R, there is a little formula and it looks a little bit different. And so what we're doing here, if R was one, we would see no change. We would have the same value every time. We were generally given a rate of interest. And so we calculate our capital R value, our big R, by doing one plus R over 100. If that interest is being paid at not at per annum, so not once a year, but multiple times a year, so monthly or quarterly or fortnightly, there's many different ways, then we would adjust our rate here. And so that little n represents that number of time periods in a year or the number of compounding periods in a year. So things you're looking for, compound interest, compound periods, anything where you see that word compounding, you want to start here. You will have that rate of exponential growth and you want to make sure in this case that when you first identify this big R, the capital R value, that it is above one. So you've got that increasing pattern. Okay, so an example here, I've got $3,000 invested in an account paying 8.2% per annum compounding half yearly. And I want to write down a recurrence relation for that. So firstly, I'm going to take note of that key information again. My value, my interest rate, my little r, 8.2, and I've been told it's compounding half yearly. So that means it's happening two times a year. So when I calculate my capital R value, I'm putting in those two pieces of information, 8.2 over 2. So I'm adjusting it so that it is um, in relation to that half yearly period. So first step, find capital R. Then we can put that together with our V0 and into that recurrence relation form. For the second part, <clears throat> again, I'm looking at how much interest will the investment earn over a four year period? So similar to what we looked at um, in the previous example. Again, interest earned will equal the value of the investment at the end of that four year period minus the principal. So how much have I has been added to that investment? So firstly, I need to work out well, what is the value of the investment at the end of that four year period? And so I'm taking my general rule form so that I can jump straight to V4. And again, remember your general rule is R to the power of N times V0. So I've taken those components from the previous question. Now note here, I haven't rounded my answer yet because I haven't finished. It's really important when you are working in this module as well, this topic area, that you are not rounding anything until the very final answer. So now when we work out our interest earned, I'm starting with the value at the end of four years minus my investment amount. That gives me the difference, which is my interest that I have earned in the four year period. And at this point, when I'm writing my final answer is when I round. It's really important to get into that habit so that when the questions become more com complex and complicated, you're in a better position and in better work habits so that you can um, be sure not to make those little rounding errors as you go and it's not having an impact on your ability to demonstrate your understanding. Um, so it's a good habit to be in when it's simple so that when it starts getting um, more challenging, that just is second nature. Okay, moving on to depreciation now. So as we've sort of said, we have three different types of depreciation that we look at. Now, depreciation as a big picture concept is usually in relation to an item or an object, an asset. 
and it's talking about the fact that most of those assets will lose value over time. So generally we're talking about objects that, um, like a car or a piece of electrical equipment that over time with wear and tear will actually lose value. Businesses tend to use um, this as a way to um, reduce tax and things like that. So for those of you who do do business management, accounting, or did commerce in year 10, you may have a memory of this. The version and the, the definition, I guess, that we use in further maths may be quite different. It's quite a basic just overview of depreciation and just having an awareness of what it generally is talking about. So the three models that we look at, flat rate and unit cost, are both examples of um, linear decay and reducing balance is an example of geometric decay. So firstly, flat rate. Linear decay, so therefore it is a constant amount each time. And so we've got our recurrence relation and our general rules look exactly the same as that linear decay. Remembering that our value of D could be given to us as a rate of depreciation, so a rate of the initial value or the purchase price. And so the first step will always be identifying or working out that value of D. And then putting all of our pieces together. So things you're looking for, flat rate depreciation and checking that when you are applying it, that you are subtracting, so the value is decreasing each time. Okay, so an example here, we've got a company purchased the machine for $60,000 and for taxation purposes, the machine is depreciated over time. We're going to look at the three different models using this same machine. So firstly, flat rate depreciation. If the machine is depreciated at a flat rate of 10% of the purchase price each year, firstly, we want to find how much will the machine depreciate annually. So what they're asking us for there is to find what is the value of D. So first we need to identify the key information, V0, our initial purchase price or our initial amount, our rate of depreciation, and then we use that to calculate our value of D. And so there, 10 over 100 times 60,000 gives us that depreciation of $6,000 each year. For part two, what's the value of the machine after three years? Again, here, I'm going to use a general rule form so that I can jump straight to my answer. So putting this into the general rule, I've got my V0 minus D times N, and then substituting in those values. So after three years, N is three, which means I have a value of $42,000. Finally, after how many years will the machine be worth $12,000? So what they're asking here is when will the value be $12,000? So if we say the value represents VN, and after how many means it's telling me that I need to solve for N, so find out how, what, how many time periods that's going to take. And so using my general rule that I constructed before, I'm going to solve that. Now, remember, you always have a calculator, a CAS calculator available to you. So the expectation is, is that you're solving using that or solving by hand. But most of us will use the solve functionality on our calculator. And so there, if N is eight, then that means after eight years. Unit cost. So unit cost, as we said, is another um, linear decay model. So again, the rules look exactly the same as they did for flat rate. In this case, we are generally told that um, the item is losing value per use. So it might be that every kilometre my car travels, it's losing value by 10 cents for every kilometre. And just to add another layer to that, sometimes we're told that in the space of a year, a particular item or piece of machinery will run through X number of units. So the first thing we're always going to do is identify that cost per unit. And if we need to adjust that to identify that value of D. Again, making sure that you are subtracting here in both the recurrence relation and general rule form so that you have a decreasing um, model. So the same example with our machine was $60,000. But this time we're checking well, what is the impact of unit cost depreciation. 
And so here, if the value of the machine de depreciates by 0.12 or 12 cents, but $0.12 dollars per use. And this time they're saying, on average, the machine is used by 45,000 times annually. So each year it gets 45,000 uses. So we're going to use that information to help us work out what is the annual depreciation. So if it's 0.12 per use and it's used 45,000 times a year, then that means in total, in one year, it will lose $5,400 in value. And so that is our value of D. Then for part two, again, finding the value after three years. So we need our V0. I'm going to put that into a general rule here. So I've used my V0 is 60,000 and my value of D that I found in part one is 5,400. After three years, that means N is three. And that allows me to find the value is $43,800. Part three, when will the machine first fall below 12,000? So same idea. The value is going to be $12,000. We want to know when it's happening. So we're solving for N and substituting that into our general rule to find N is 8.89. Now here we need to consider the context of the question is when will it first fall below $12,000? And we can't just say after 8.89 years, we need to work in whole units of time. So at eight years, the value won't quite yet be below 12,000. At nine years, it will definitely be below 12,000. So here, regardless of what that decimal is, so the rounding isn't about the decimal, it's about the context of the um, question. So at eight years, we wouldn't have depreciated it enough Sorry, and at nine years, we have first exceeded. So that's why our answer is nine. So those questions can be tricky. And so look out for them when you're doing um, your practice throughout this unit and also your revision at the end to see that you're always checking the context, not just rounding automatically. <clears throat> Finally, we have reducing balance depreciation. So this is our geometric form and Therefore, our recurrence relation and our general rule form is when we are working with this geometric form here, so capital R. And remember, we do need to calculate that from a rate of depreciation. But notice here we are depreciating, not earning interest. So it's one minus this little calculation of R over N over 100. So remember we said if our capital R value is between 0 and 1, then we're going to have that decay, that decreasing value. So you need to make sure that you've got your right value of R there. Most other things are the same. Be careful you're looking for the keywords reducing balance depreciation. So later on in the topic, we look at a concept of reducing balance loans that is very different to the reducing balance depreciation. So continuing this same example with our machine purchased for $60,000, um, we're now looking at the reducing balance depreciation. So if the value of the machine after N years is given by the formula VN equals 60,000 times 0 0.85 to the power of N. So here we've been given this rule as the general rule form. So there's a little bit less work that we have to do. But the first thing we're being asked is to identify by what percentage will the machine depreciate annually. So what that is saying is we know the capital R value, but we want to find out well, what is the small r, what percentage were, you, were, were they working off to get that rule. And so we can say we'll let our calculation for capital R equal 0.85. Now it's depreciating annually, so we don't have to make any adjustment to the percentage, which means we can write that as one minus R over 100 to solve for R, and that gives us 15%. For part two, we're then asked, very similar to the previous examples, calculate the value of the machine after three years. So here we've been given the general rule, so we can simply substitute in that value of N. So after three years, we get this answer here, 36,847.5.
Now, as I said before, we need to show our answer with two decimal places. So in this case, that actually means $36,847.50. So we do want to be writing to two decimal places and including that zero there. Finally, when will the machine's value first fall below 12,000? So same pattern as what we were doing before. We're going to let the value equal 12,000 and we're going to solve for n to find out when that will occur. Again, we've been given the general rule, so we're substituting those values in. And here we find n is 9.903. And again, consider the context. At nine years, we won't yet have fallen below 12,000 if it's a decreasing um, <clears throat> pattern. So we need to go to after 10 years before we reach that value. Okay, moving on to loans and investments. So in this section, we're just going to look at two really basic styles of loan and investments. In um, this topic, in chapter six, really, we work through um, a whole lot more of the applications of this. Some of these you will have seen last year, potentially in general maths. And I know there was some difference between what our Plenty Campus students and our Ridgeway Campus students studied. However, um, we cover everything this year. So just going through the basics that I know everyone saw and we'll pick it up um, in our classes as we go through the next few weeks. <clears throat> so firstly, reducing balance loans. So as I said, this is not depreciation. It is different. Here we are talking about a loan. And this is a very stock standard traditional loan. I have taken some money out of the bank. I've taken a loan out. The bank is charging me interest for the privilege of having that money. But I don't want to just accumulate a whole lot of debt. So what I am doing is I'm making periodic payments. So constant payments being made on a regular basis. And so what that means is whilst that money has been withdrawn, the bank is charging me interest, so making my balance, what I owe, grow. But at the same time, I'm making payments off that, so decay, decreasing, that are bigger than what the bank is charging me. So over time, I will eventually pay off the loan. So a couple of key things in our rule. This is the one where we are combining both geometric growth and some linear decay in this case. Our V0 is still our principal, our starting point. In this case, because the bank is charging me interest and that is a representation of growth, my capital R, my big R value is one plus R over N, where R, little r, lowercase r, is my rate of interest per annum and n is the number of compounding periods per year. And as you'll see in the example, we are off, the wording is often such that it is 6% per annum compounding monthly or compounding annually. So they will always use that phrase. So that's what you want to look out for. And in this context, our value of D is our payment. So as I said, look out for that reducing balance loan. Make sure it's the right thing, not depreciation. And you're looking for any scenario where there's a compound interest and a payment. OK, that will help you work out what section you're looking for. For this type, there is no general rule. There, is, there does exist, one does exist, but we are not expected to utilise it or know what it is. However, we have a finance solver application on our calculator, on our CAS calculator, that um, you will be expected to use and know how to use well. So we will look at that at the towards the end of the presentation. So just firstly here for this example, you can see these types of scenarios tend to be um, very wordy. There's a lot of information. So the thing that you want to be doing as you're reading it through is identifying those key things. So here I have Phil who would like to purchase a block of land. He's going to borrow, so borrow means I'm taking out a loan, so that's one key thing I'm looking for. He's going to borrow $350,000, so that's my initial value. Phil will make monthly repayments of $3,517.28, and he will be charged interest at the rate of 4.8% per annum, compounding monthly. So all of that key information, I've got 
my initial value. I've got monthly repayments, so that tells me that, and it's also stated again that it's compounding monthly. Um, so I know if I need to adjust my interest rate, it's going to be dividing by 12 to make it monthly payments and monthly compounds. And then I have this payment amount, which is my value of D. So I want to put all of that together into a recurrence relation to model my loan. And so I'm simply taking those key pieces of information. Firstly, always first thing is calculate R. So what is this adjusted rate of interest that's being charged? And then putting that together. So I have my initial value, $350,000, BN plus one times my value of R that I've just calculated times BN and minus my payment amount. Okay, annuities. So these are basically the same idea as a loan, but instead of the bank giving me money, I'm giving the bank the money. So I'm putting money into the bank. I am growing my investment by um, earning interest. So the bank is paying me interest for the privilege of having my money this time. And what I am doing is withdrawing a repayment. So it's almost like I've received um, an inheritance and I've decided I'm going to live off it. And so what I'm doing, I'm hopefully earning some interest, but unfortunately I enjoy rather a lavish lifestyle and the payment I'm taking out each time is more than the interest that the bank's willing to pay me. So eventually my money will run out. Eventually my interest will, uh, sorry, my investment will run out. So that's why it is very similar to um, mathematically in terms of the rules that we use, it's very similar to that reducing balance loan. <clears throat> So the things you want to look for in uh, questions around this um, are the word annuity or again compounding with payment but you're looking for an investment this time. The key thing in our rule here, okay, our R value is still increasing because we are earning interest so it is still a growth and our D is still subtracted because we are still um, taking out more money than what is in there. So we're reducing that balance of our investment each time. So looking at our example here, again, a lot of information. So you want to be reading through and then identifying those key features. So Martha invested a sum of money at an interest rate of 9.4% per annum, compounding quarterly. Her initial investment was $35,000 and she will be paid $1,260 per quarter from her investment. So key things, it's an investment. We've got an interest rate of 9.4% per annum. So that's my um, value of small r. Compounding quarterly tells me that this is compounding four times a year. So when I adjust my interest rate, it's divided by four. My initial amount, 35,000 and my payment per quarter, D, 1,260. So again, first thing I'm going to do so that I can make or construct my recurrence relation is take those key features and find my value of R. So again, my interest rate divided by four gives me this value of R, 1.0235. I can then take that and put it all together into my recurrence relation. So nice and straightforward. So my initial value, $35,000, um, A N plus one is equal to my value of R times A N minus my payment amount. So that's all really handy. And if I wanted to find, well, what was Martha's balance in one quarter, two quarters, three quarters, I could use this recurrence relation and that would work for me. But much like a lot of the other content we looked at, we want to be able to jump to any time period that we want. And because we don't use a general rule, what we do use is finance solver. You, if you're not already familiar with this application on your calculator, you will become very familiar by the end of this topic. It can be confusing at times, but once you understand how to use it and you have a really solid, um, I guess, or a confident understanding of when to use it and how to manipulate the values in there, then it can be, it can make really challenging questions quite straightforward. <clears throat> so please persist, practice and persist. 
So where you find it is just from our regular calculator page. Okay, so it's in our finance menu and it's finance solver. It looks like this here. And so each of those little boxes there, you can enter some information into. And so we've got these defined and these should be in your bound reference as well. You wanna make sure that you have those. However, if you forget what something represents, you can see at the bottom of my page, when I am in the box for N, it actually gives me the definition there, number of payments. So each of these components are very similar to the components that we were identifying for our recurrence relation. So when we are doing questions using Finance Solver, what we want to do is the same process. So taking the question, reading it through and highlighting and labelling that key information so that we know what to work with. One of the things that um, people find the most challenging is thinking about um, money flow. So it's really important, you need to be able to represent which direction the money is moving in. And by that I mean, is the money going into the bank or is the bank giving you money into your pocket? So the way I tend to think about it is that if I am giving money to the bank, if the money is leaving me going elsewhere, going to the bank, then I put that as um, a negative value. If I am getting money from the bank, so I'm receiving the payment from my, um, from my investment, or I'm receiving a big lump sum because I've taken out a loan to do something else with, then I treat that as a positive value. So I think about which direction is the money flowing in. And as long as I am consistent, everything that goes into the bank, I put as a negative value. Everything that comes to me personally is a positive value then I will always be okay with my use of finance solver. Some of you may have been taught to do it the opposite way. That is also okay, as long as you are consistent about the direction the money is moving and the sign you use. So what that looks like, <clears throat> we go back to Phil and his block of land. So same scenario, he's borrowed $350,000, he still has payments, he still has an interest rate compounding monthly, but this time we want to use Finance Solver to find the balance after five years. So the first thing we want to do reading our question is identify those key pieces of information and enter it into our Finance Solver or make note of it. VCard do expect that you will note down these values. You can't show them what you did on your calculator. So this is your way of doing it. So writing this list of values down and indicating what you wrote into your calculator is the equivalent of showing an equation. So here, if we're saying N is the total number of payments that have occurred in the time frame. So if we want to know the balance of the loan after five years and we are compounding and making repayments monthly, then that means there has been a total of 60 repayments. So five times 12. Our interest rate is always given as per annum. So here we take the 4.8. We do not need to adjust it. The calculator will do that work for us. My uh, principal value is my starting value. So I borrowed or Phil borrowed $350,000. And so see here, I've said that that is a positive. Phil got that money. So that's a positive value of $350,000. However, each month, in this case, so payments made for time period. So each month he's giving to the bank, paying back to the bank $3,517.28. So I'm representing that as a negative because he's giving that money to the bank. FB represents our future value. So we are going to solve for what is that future value after five years. This PPY and CPY, what that represents technically is the payments made per year and the compound periods per year. In further maths, these will always be exactly the same. So you can see here he's making monthly repayments and his interest is being compounded monthly. They will always be the same time frame. So we tell our calculator how many times per year so monthly means it's happening 12 times in the year. 
The very last thing, PMT, is just a reference to when is the payment made. We always, forever, keep that as end. There is no need to change it. It is the default setting in the calculator, and that is always the process that we use in Further Maths. So when I enter those values in and go to my FB box and hit enter, it miraculously does all the calculation for me. And so at the moment that is saying a negative value, which means if the loan was shut off right then on that day at the end of five years, Fuel would have to give back to the bank that money. So he owes the bank that $206,744.45. Again, note the value, the decimals here, we always round to two decimal places. Another example, so back to Martha and her investment. So again, same information from Martha's investment, but now we're going to use the finance solver to find what is her balance after five years of this scenario. So she's invested at 9.4% per annum, it's compounding quarterly, which means four times in a year. We have her initial investment, so our principal value at $35,000. She's making payments, or she's, sorry, receiving payments of $1,260. And we're wanting to find the balance after five years. So in this case here, five years of quarterly um, payments means a total of 20 payments have occurred in that time frame. So our N, our total payments will be 20. Again, our interest rate is just the per annum interest, so 9.4. This time, the principal value I have noted as a negative, because <clears throat> at the beginning, Martha gave $35,000 to the bank. She put it into the bank. So it came from her to the bank, so a negative value. However, the payments I've represented as a positive because they are coming from the bank to Martha, so she's getting them. So here, that direction matters. Again, payments per year, compounds per year, it's all happening quarterly, so we have those as four. And when we enter that information into our finance solver and go into our future value box, hit enter, it solves for us. And here we have a positive value. So that means if the account was closed, the bank would take what's left and give it back to Martha. And she would get a balance of $23,991.42, correct to that two decimal places. Okay, so that is it in terms of the overview for this evening, the presentation.